Good morning. A few years ago at seminary, I took a class called Introduction to Preaching, and my distinguished preaching professor was fond of telling the class his recipe for a decent sermon. It went something like this. A decent sermon has one text, three points, and a really good poem. Fortunately for me, and perhaps unfortunately for you, my distinguished preaching professor is not with us this morning, and I seem to have gotten things a little bit mixed up, because this morning I have for you three texts, one point, and a really bad pun. But I'll let you be the judge of how that all works out in the end. Three texts today, all from today's lectionary readings, and each one revolving around a fascinating, larger-than-life character from three different parts of the Bible. Earlier in the service, we read of Joseph, the great patriarch and the favorite son of Jacob, whose dreams and special coat today have landed him in trouble with his brothers. At the climax of today's reading, those jealous brothers throw Joseph into a deep pit, stripped of his coat and without any food or water. We also read earlier of Elijah, arguably the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. But in today's passage, he's hiding in a dark cave, feeling sorry for himself and struggling just to hear God's voice. Finally, we read of Peter, first among the disciples and the unquestioned leader of the early church after Jesus' death. But here in today's passage, Peter has lost sight of his Savior, frightened by the storm outside of the boat and sinking beneath the waves in the middle of the sea. And I'm afraid there we must leave all three of our heroes of the faith, for the time being at least. Because before we tackle the great challenges faced by Joseph, Elijah, and Peter, I'd like to fast forward us a few millennia to the present time and to some challenges that might seem a little bit more recognizable to us. I'm thinking in particular of a very specific challenge, one that most of us encounter on a daily basis. Raise your hand if you've ever used or relied upon a computer to accomplish something important to you. Now, keep your hand raised high in the air if your computer has always come through for you 100% of the time, never crashing, never freezing, never losing important information, and never blocking your path with a loud, obnoxious beep and a disturbing error message that threatens to undo everything you've worked so hard to accomplish in the last 15 minutes or more. By the way, if your hand is still up in the air, you are either being less than honest this morning or else you just haven't been using your computer a lot lately. I love computers. My father was a computer programmer. And some of my earliest memories consist of half-assembled computer parts strewn across the living room floor, of learning to write small computer programs in a language called BASIC on my Commodore 64 computer, and of dialing into the internet with my dad to play text-based video games in an age long before it was even called the internet. But no matter how comfortable you are with technology, no matter how smart you are, and certainly regardless of whether you're a Mac, a PC, or a Texas Instruments scientific calculator, if you use computers long enough, eventually you will run into a digital brick wall. In the glory days of Microsoft, this happened so often that the blue colored screen that informed you of a fatal error was nicknamed the blue screen of death, or the BSOD for short. On some error screens underneath that message, a, the user is presented with a small button that has one option, OK. When you click on OK, your program shuts down and you lose whatever you were working on. I always found this button to be bitterly frustrating. It's bad enough that I'm about to lose everything. Do I really have to be okay with it as well? Other error screens will instruct a user to simultaneously push and hold three buttons. You probably already know what they are. Control, Alt, Delete. This little routine shuts down your computer and restarts it. It's known as a reboot. 
And I've always kind of wondered what frustrated computer cowboy first came up with that term and whether he was using calfskins or steel-toed boots to get the job done. If rebooting doesn't solve your problem, there is one final, more drastic approach that you can take. Reformatting the hard drive. Reformatting basically erases everything on the computer and starts you over from scratch. You have to reinstall all of your software, including the operating system. With a reboot, you only lose what you were working on at the time, but with a reformat, you lose everything. Now, this will fix just about any software problem that you have, but it comes at a great cost and obviously is a last resort. Back to our texts and to our heroes of the faith that we left suspended in crisis. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your technological outlook, Joseph, Elijah, and Peter all lived long before the digital era. But in today's scripture passages, they are all in a similar predicament. Joseph has crashed into the bottom of a deep pit. Elijah is stuck in his dark cave, and Peter is frozen by fear, sinking beneath the waves. And all of them are at risk of losing everything that they have worked for and everything that God has called them to do and to be. When I read these passages, I want to yell out to them across time, Control, Alt, Delete, Reboot, Reformat. It's the only way. But I am not the programmer here. And there are no Control, Alt, Delete keys in ancient Israel. Fortunately, however, there is a master programmer at hand for them and a different key combination of sorts. For Peter, the master programmer pushes the keys, Jesus plus hand plus boat. And the wind calms down and Peter is safe again. Since Peter didn't lose everything, only his faith in Jesus and only that momentarily, this is more of a reboot than a reformat. Or technically you might call it a reboot. For Elijah, the master programmer pushes the keys, wind plus earthquake plus fire plus silence. And it is with the final keystroke, silence, that the voice of the Lord comes to Elijah at last, instructing him and promising him the help of Prophet 2.0 Beta, also known as Elisha. This too is more of a reboot than a reformat. It's a recommissioning for service and even a bit of an upgrade. For Joseph, the master programmer pushes the keys brothers plus greed plus traveling merchants. And instead of dying in the pit, Joseph is sold into slavery, bound for Egypt, where his dreams will finally be put to good use. This is, of course, a full reformat. Joseph loses everything and everyone he's ever known and has to start over from scratch with nothing but the promise of the master programmer, the dream giver who works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But the story, these stories don't end here. The scripture message never ends simply on the page, but rather it continues to speak through the ages right down into our own lives and our own situations. And we so often get stuck. We crash. We freeze. But as Christians, we place our trust and hope in a God of second chances who makes all things new. Every Sunday, we gather here for worship and we press the buttons, confession plus repentance, and then our master programmer presses the final button in the sequence, unconditional grace, and we reboot. Psalm 103 tells us that as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Control, alt, delete, reboot, reformat. 
At the heart of that last word, reformat, is a word that we as Presbyterians should be very familiar with. Reform. We are the children of the 16th century reformation of the reformers Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox who left behind a medieval church that was frozen, stuck, and plagued by error messages. They started over from scratch by pressing five simple keys. By scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, and glory to God alone. These are known as the famous five solas of the Reformation. Sola meaning only or alone, as our Spanish friends today might recognize in the word solamente. Control, alt, delete. Reboot, reformat. These days, our denomination, the PCUSA, continues to lose members and lose churches to changing cultural patterns, to aging congregations, or to whatever controversy rules the day. Sometimes it seems that, like Peter, we are slipping beneath the waves, paralyzed by fear and losing sight of our Savior. We yearn longingly for those glory days when, like Joseph, our community held the status of the favorite son, blessed by the Father and the envy of our Baptist, Methodist, and Episcopalian brothers and sisters. Sometimes we, as a church, feel stuck, frozen, and about to crash. We would do well to remember one of the great mottos of the Presbyterian Church, Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda, or the Church Reformed and Always Being Reformed. In other words, God is not through with us yet. We would also do well to remember that Peter did not save himself. Only Christ saves. But we do have a job to do. It's what Peter and the disciples did next. Verse 32 and 33 tell us that when Jesus and Peter got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So get in the boat plus worship, plus proclaim Jesus. Control, alt, delete, reboot, reformat. And even when we come to the very end of our days, when we are lowered into a six foot deep pit and sealed in a concrete cave that neither Joseph nor Elijah could possibly have escaped from, that blue screen of death holds no terror for us anymore. Why? Because we know the story. We know about the cross, the crucifixion, and the sacrifice made by God's only Son. But more importantly, we know what happened just three days later. Say it with me this time. Control, alt, delete, reboot, reformat. It's the greatest reboot of all time. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, so we too are promised to the resurrection and the life everlasting. This, my friends, is strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Thanks be to God.